Dear all, welcome to our annual Crest Talks. Every year, the Department of Art History at Leiden can host two PhD candidates from the United States or Canada, thanks to the support of the Samuel H. Kress Foundation. We have made it a habit to give their research a public forum. Since every year, the Kress Fellows in Leiden give a presentation of their thesis, PhD thesis, or part of it. You can put all your uh, questions uh, in the chat. We will discuss them after the two uh, presentations. Let me introduce our first speaker. That's uh, Cynthia Koch of Yale University. She studies the material culture of trade and empire. Her dissertation focuses on sensorial engagement in making and craft experiments with Mother of Pearl in the early modern Dutch world. Other research interests include history and specimen collecting, crafting under European colonial governance, and mimetic material practices. Cynthia, the floor is yours. Hi, um, thank you for that introduction and um, thank you everyone for being here. I will give a bit of context for this talk as Stein has asked us to do. So I'm interested uh, broadly in thinking about how early modern makers were using materials to think about the world around them and how material literacy was essential to the work of making. And currently I'm thinking about bioplastic resources that were being imported to the Netherlands and that had become an essential component of the domestic material landscape by the late um, 18th century. And my current project explores Mother of Pearl and its unique material properties like flexibility, resilience, and iridescence, which is what I'll be talking about today. Um, this is very much still a work in progress, so I look forward to any questions and comments, feedback that people have. A colored edition of Albertus Seba's Thesaurus of Natural History Specimen demonstrates the difficulty of illustrating Mother of Pearl. Volume three of the Thesaurus, focusing on the life, focusing on life from the sea, includes not only shell specimens, but also a carved nautilus and 22 carved Mother of Pearl roundels by famed Mother of Pearl workers, Cornelius Bellican and J.B. Barkhausen. Artist Jay Fortown hand-colored several editions of the thesaurus, including the one shown here. Scholars have misunderstood the washes of pinks, blues, and greens that Fortown applied to the shell as artistic license, but the artist did not exaggerate the shell's colors. On the contrary, his interpretation demonstrated that he witnessed the Mother of Pearl's objects firsthand and made an effort to capture their visual effects. The layers of color for town applied to the engravings revealed his understanding of Mother of Pearl not as pure white, but as alive with the shifting spectrum of color. What for town observed and tried to record was the shell's iridescence. Even today, it can be difficult to capture Mother of Pearl's iridescence in still images. And here is an example of a shell from Seba's collection that now exists at the Amsterdam Museum. And you can see in the photograph it appears pearly white, but if you were to see it in person, it would have a much richer spectrum of color. Although the specific term iridescence was not in an early modern Dutch vocabulary, artists, writers, and natural philosophers all observed this phenomenon and tried to capture it in paint, in words, and in mathematical terms. Yet the physics of the effect were poorly understood and the specifics of the interaction between material and light were not yet evident. Natural philosophers had connected rainbows to light refracting through water after a storm, but the iridescence of Mother of Pearl, in some sense a materialized rainbow, remained a paradox. Rather than just reflecting, iridescent material was sometimes even described as emanating light. So today I'd like to consider the problem of iridescence. How did artists and natural philosophers approach the challenge of interpreting and recording a visually kinetic material? Observed qualities of material were an important part of knowing and therefore recognizing and ordering them. 
in Save Us the Source, Bertown thought it worthwhile to paint the complex iridescent effects of Mother of Pearl, not to embellish the shell, but because it was an essential characteristic. Likewise, naturalists like Robert Hooke and Isaac Newton formulated explanations for iridescence that were grounded in microscopic observations of natural materials, and painter William Clausoon Haida generated a series of interpretations of a nautilus shell that relied on close object study. Each of these investigators returned to materials like mother of pearl, whose iridescent surfaces became sites for working out ideas about the interplay between light, color, material, and liveliness. So I wanna begin by defining iridescence. A 21st century understanding of iridescence positions it as a phenomenon of light physics perceived through vision. Iridescence describes color that shifts in hue as the viewing angle shifts. When light hits a surface, some amount is reflected or scattered while the majority of the rays penetrate the material. Light bounces off a shiny object, metals for example, and a more organized structure creating the perceived shine. In contrast, a material such as a wool textile reflects light rays in, mil in multiple scattered directions, creating a dull and opaque appearance. Unlike other terms used to describe the effect of light, iridescence refers to the specific physics of light passing through transparent layers and reflecting differently to create a range of visible color. An iridescent surface is composed of translucent or semi-translucent layers, like the layers of nacre seen in the microscopic image of the shell on the right. Each layer reflects light at a single angle of incidence, in contrast to the scattered reflection of materials like wool. Interference colors occur when a reflected ray of light intersects with another ray, reflecting off the layer above or below it. The two separate rays might be on the same wavelength and reinforce each other, or be on different wavelengths and negate each other. The so-called stacking of light rays that are all interfering with each other creates the visual phenomenon of iridescence. The angle at which one views the iridescent material changes the angle of incidence and the angle of, re of reflection of the light, resulting in a shifting color and a motion effect. So as this description implies, iridescence is a structural color. The perception of color is created by the structure of the material rather than any pigment it contains. Iridescence is, per is prevalent in nature, particularly among arthropods and mollusks, and results when light interacts with the mo molecular construction of material. The wings of a morpho butterfly, for example, are not actually blue. They're composed of translucent tubes that absorb other wavelengths of light and reflect blue. Um, similarly, nacreous shell like nautilus and pearl oyster also appear iridescent because of their layered structure of argonite platelets. Different types of nacreous shell have different platelets arrangements that alter our perception of their coloration. Abalone on the left, for example, shows stronger greens and reds, while the pearl oyster shell on the right has a fainter but more fully rainbow iridescence. If the butterfly wings were ground up, or if the structure of the shell's argonite platelets were destroyed, they would no longer appear iridescent or any color at all. Seventeenth-century investigators were not yet able to explain wavelength reflection and structural coloration, but they were beginning to observe and theorize about light's interaction with matter. While new optical instruments especially the microscope and the telescope, augmented the ability of the human eye and revealed that there was more to the world than the naked eye could see. These tools also upended what people knew about sight. The observations prompted closer investigation of linkages between material structure and visual experience. In 1665, Robert Hooke included in his Micrographia one of the earliest recorded observations of, on iridescence in the material. In a section titled, Of the Colors Observable in Muscovy Glass and Other Thin Bodies, Hook studies a mineral now known as muscovite, which is composed of translucent layers similar to mother of pearl. 
he observed that the mineral is, quote, compounded of an infinite number of thin flakes joined or generated one upon another, so close and smooth, as with many hundreds of them to make one smooth and thin plate of a transparent, flexible substance, and that with his microscope he could observe the position of colors in the material in respect to one another, that was the very same as in the rainbow." Unquote. Hook is amazed by the geometry and construction of this material, the consistent thickness of the layers, as well as its iridescence. And in this example, the um, muscovite is flaked apart, so it's already much less iridescent. Although Hook is unable to explain iridescence fully, he notes that he has observed the same phenomenon when bright light interacts with peacock feathers, pearls and mother of pearl, bubbles with children used to make soap water, and a so-called vitrified metal surface like hardened steel. He, he hypothesizes that the material is, um, quote, cause of the apparition of these several colors is some lamina or plate of a transparent or pellucid body, unquote. Similarly, in his 1704 publication, Optics, Newton describes the phenomenon of iridescence in the, quote, finely colored feathers of some birds, and particularly those of peacock tails, that do in the very same part appear of several colors in several positions of the eye after the very same manner that thin plates were found to do. While the physics of iridescence remain mysterious, Hooke's and Newton's observations pinpointed a link between a material structure and how light's interactions with the structure can cause a perceived visual effect. In parallel, still life painters needed to study iridescent materials directly to understand how to convincingly, convincingly replicate their perceived effect. The work of artists like Heda, famous for monochromatic palettes and limited use of color, reveals a close contemplation of human vision, perspective, and illusionism, presented in the polished finish of a carefully constructed painting. His compositions often carefully arrange nodless shells or mother of pearl studded knives alongside other reflective utensils like glass roamers and silver beakers. In this example, uh, the 1640 painting centers on a mounted nodless cup depicted in an opaque silvery white with a radiating coral colored center. The shell is supported by a kneeling merman on a silver base. With the mother of pearl shells of focus, the composition spirals into a contemplation of translucence, reflectivity, and luster as the cup is juxtaposed with a raw oyster shell, a tall beer glass, an ikru linen rag, and a muted silver dish. Each of these objects varies slightly from Hayda's neutral palette, allowing him to display his mastery of reflectivity and opacity. Hayda consistently produces new variations on a set of objects across his compositions, rearranging their positions, context, and relation to each other. For example, he returns repeatedly to this nodless cup. Hayda's faithful depiction of the merman stem suggests that he had a specific cup on which to model his paintings, and that he studied it carefully to reproduce what he perceived. In the detail on the left, Heda emphasizes the blue undertones of the shell, particularly along its outer left edge, while in the detail on the right, he brings out the pink iridescences in the shell. His depiction of the shell in both warm and cool tones reflects not only artistic license, but also the mutability of the shell itself, and the ability of a reflective surface to take on its surroundings. In their multiple iterations, Heda's painted nodless cup exemplifies how artists grappled with representing shifting iridescence in a realistic manner. On one level, artists deliberately returned to imagery which they could skillfully execute to draw attention to their virtuosity. Their chosen motif became linked to their artistic identity. Learning to depict specific materials proficiently, however, was not only a matter of efficiency. Still life painting aimed for illusionistic truth, relaying even the imperfections of real objects. Staging objects in varied placements and environments allowed painters to practice different ways of translating them. 
They introduced variation not only to enliven their work, but also because the experience of materials is fundamentally variable, changing with their surroundings. Taken all together, Haida's many paintings of the Nautilus Cup become a detailed study of its materiality and a careful consideration of how to reproduce an object in paint. The staging of still lifes is perhaps comparable to the way in which natural specimens are isolated for diagrammatic study, an approach art historian Janice Neary has termed specimen logic. Artists would often present a creature against a blank background, isolating it from its natural environment and presenting animals as individual objects. Each page of Sebas Thesaurus, for example, features a specimen floating in unrealized space. Although several creatures or objects might sometimes occupy the same page, they usually have no defined relationship to each other. For example, this diagram of a nautilus cup on the left, which is once again painted with faint pinks and greens unrelated to the applied imagery, is not pictured with a mount and is instead placed alongside other views of the same shell, as well as an additional engraving of uncarved shells. Likewise, in still life painting, the abstraction of context left only the assemblage of materials as a point of focus. Successful still lives relied on convincingly conveying the tangible materiality of objects. Artists used the abstraction of space to focus their study and draw viewers' attentions to the object. Although still lives depicted commodities and reflected an expanded material environment facilitated by Dutch trading companies, artists conventionally depict the objects removed from their market context. Compositions are consciously artificial, with objects carefully arranged rather than found in a domestic setting. A tall glass might still be half full with beer, but its drinker is nowhere to be seen. A porcelain bowl overflows with fruit, yet is not set among other consumables in a kitchen or a dining room. It is nodless, while placed alongside other household materials, is also set against a nondescript, evenly colored wall. These staged images de-emphasize any documentation of daily life, instead insisting on a close examination of objects and their materiality. Yet these renderings, despite the attempts of artists to adhere closely to visual observation, would always present only a partial representation of the iridescent material. Attempts to depict liveliness in print and paint were often frustrating. Knowing that he would be unable to replicate iridescence, Fertown emphasized the multicolored surface of mother of pearl shells as a strategy of visual description. Natural compendia like Sebus Thesaurus, rather than focusing on realism, systematized appearances and emphasized visual aspects of animals that allowed people to identify them. Textual descriptions of iridescent shell often relied on analogy. Naturalists like Rumpius recorded observing a Nautilus's mother pearl interior, which, although, which, quote, although showing more green than red, gives a reflection like a rainbow, unquote. Rumpius relied on readers' experience of another natural phenomenon, the rainbow, to understand iridescence. The subjectivity of vision became particularly apparent in iridescent materials. In painting their experience of iridescent effects, artists were hardly imitating life, but rather examining it. In describing and replicating materials such as the Nautilus, artists and naturalists faced the challenge of not only communicating its particular materiality to an audience, but also its liveliness. With how movement and physical presence define perception of iridescent materials, they were difficult to render as still images. Other artists chose alternative strategies for suggesting a material's presence. Like Heda, the painter Willem Kalf also specialized in luxury still lifes and became known for his depictions of light. In his 1662 still life with Chinese bowl and Nautilus, Kalf paints the shell with an unearthly glow recalling sunlight beneath water. Kalf's strategy reflects a different approach to conveying the visual impact of iridescence, relying less on realism 
than on evocation. In another example, um, artist Otto Marcius von Schreck, who popularized the genre of Soto Bosco painting, thought deeply about the materiality of his work, going as far as pasting real butterfly wings onto the canvas. A recent study by the Fitzwilliam Museum identified wings from the garden tiger moth, which is circled in red on the painting. Um, and alongside it is an example of how the wings would have looked when they were freshly um, pasted into the painting. Van Trigg's inclusion of butterfly wings suggests that there are limits to illusionistic painting, especially with materials with structural coloration like butterfly wings. Such materials with visual depth and instability challenge artists' attempts at painted translations. Mother of Pearl itself, like other oceanic beings such as coral, seem to occupy an interstitial space between vitality and dormancy, retaining a sense of animacy in its visual liveliness. Although the specific term iridescence was a later invention, scientists and artists noticed and investigated the phenomenon long before it was named. Artists worked alongside natural philosophers in the enterprise of studying materials. Not only were scientific illustrations necessary companions to written explanations of unfamiliar material, whether they are microscopic or distant, still life painting also pushed artists to think closely about how to translate the presence of objects into a visual experience. In their reflections of life, artists and thinkers forefronted bodily engagement evoking not only sight, but also other senses in their attempts to make sense of the world around them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cindy, for this uh, very interesting talk where scientists and artists meet such a, a topic which is very often studied these days with lots of interest. I think there will be many questions, just put them in the chat because first we go to uh, Felicity. I just opened her PowerPoint and I put Felicity there. So, and then I can, uh, can introduce her, but let's first look. Oh yes, there you are. I wanted to say, let's first look if she's still there, but you're there. I'm very happy. Uh, our second speaker is Felicity Good, at the University of Santa Barbara, University of California. Her advisor is Mark Meadow. Her areas of concentration are the artistic exchange between Northern Europe, Spain, and colonial Latin America during the 16th century, the history of print and book production, and the early modern epistemologies. The title of her dissertation is Locating Childhood, the Visual Culture of Children in Early Modern Antwerp and Mexico City. Felicity, the floor is yours. Thanks for the um, introduction. Stein. Also, I apologize in advance. I'm recovering from RSV, so if I cough a lot, um, just bear with me. Um, <clears throat> so to place this in the context of my larger project, uh, this is um, part of my first chapter that is investigating the visual and material culture of childhood education in the city of Antwerp. Um, and it fits into this kind of a uh, larger set of questions I'm asking about where children fit into the civic order um, in the global early modern period. So um, my chapter is tentatively titled Ludum Literarium or Frontisterium, the visual culture of childhood education in 16th century Antwerp. Represented in Antwerp artist Dirk Fellert's small woodblock print, a schoolroom with teachers and pupils, is a lively 16th century vernacular school. Teachers dispense knowledge of reading and writing in a room full of young boys and girls eagerly undertaking their educations. At the upper left corner, a schoolmaster checks the student's work from behind his desk while overseeing this entire enterprise. The spacious classroom is divided into two levels. On the ground floor, girls and young women are taught, and <clears throat> in an alcove in the background, a large group of girls, for example, sits around a long table engaged in a lively conversation, while smaller clusters of adolescents or young adult women 
are scattered across the benches in the foreground. In the rafters above, boys divided into several small groups sit and listen to their teachers. It is not hard to imagine that this school is a noisy and somewhat chaotic space filled with the overlapping voices of children and adults resonating throughout the large schoolroom. But through this commotion, there remains a sense of organization and order to how education is being administered. Considering the large number of students, both boys and girls, and the wide diversity of ages depicted, the print suggests that by 1526, schools were already a popular enterprise within the city of Antwerp, and there existed a clear demand for childhood education. Fellert's print presents to the viewer a vision of what vernacular schooling might have looked like and raises questions about how this type of education was practiced and understood in, the early, in early modern Antwerp. Who was teaching, what material, and to whom? Where did these schools operate? And with a growing demand for schooling, what steps were taken to regulate these businesses? What larger social and cultural conditions <clears throat> informed the expansion of and changing attitudes towards children's education? And how do the broader visual, material, and textual cultures of early modern schooling reveal not only the practical aspects of education, but also the larger ideological concerns surrounding the importance of both children and childhood education. The production of images dealing explicitly with vernacular schooling correlates closely to the spread of humanist theories concerning both pedagogy and how to properly prepare children for their eventual entry into adult society, as well as with practical reforms to schooling undertaken in Antwerp throughout the 16th century. Prominent humanist educators, including most notably Rudolf Agricola and Erasmus, linked childhood education directly to the promise of sustained civic success and virtuosity, central aspects of humanist thought. With this shift in thinking, children were positioned as a discrete social group with their own needs, customs, and institutions, while childhood education became a vital aspect of a child's intellectual and social development, while simultaneously being foundational for Antwerp's long-term civic prosperity. Beyond the spread of humanism into Northern Europe, the city itself witnessed a distinct increase in the demand for institutionalized education, beginning for children at a young age. The number of teachers and schools active in the city rose dramatically during the late 15th and early 16th centuries. To meet the changing needs of teachers, Antwerp established the St. Ambrose Guild for Schoolmasters in 1530, only four years after the creation of Fellard's print. The guild became largely responsible for overseeing education within the city, including the activities of vernacular primary and secondary schools, and to an extent, Antwerp's papal Latin schools. Images of schools and children engaged in learning, I argue, operated as sites through which adult viewers could interrogate the complex understanding of childhood education, its institutionalization, broadening popularity, and the conceptual reframing of its importance for children's position within the larger social order. Early modern Antwerp provides a good case study for the development of and visual culture surrounding childhood education. The history of educational practices and regulations in the city are well documented, and the archival record is relatively well preserved. By the middle of the 16th century, the city experienced a swift ascent to the position of Northern Europe's premier trading port a shift accompanied by an explosive growth in population. The influx of foreign merchants into the city and the success of local businesses and industries 
led to an increased demand for a range of skilled workers educated in, at minimum, reading, writing, and oftentimes arithmetic. This was a set of skills that constituted the primary subject matter in Antwerp's vernacular schools. Additionally, <clears throat> the expansion of the printing industry and the city's robust book trade meant that Antwerp, despite not having a university like many other major European towns, sat at an intellectual crossroads. Both the development of institutionalized schooling within the city and the changing attitudes towards the social and educational needs of children were well underway as Antwerp itself was undergoing significant and rapid change. My analysis of children's education in the city, however, begins in the late 15th century. Vernacular schools were already a somewhat popular enterprise as early as 1468, for example, a group of teachers banded together to petition the city council for an official charter outlining regulations for the practice of teaching and the payment of fees because they were getting very fed up with parents not paying teachers for their services. And a little more than a decade later, the renowned humanist educator Rudolf Agricola um, was offered and subsequently declined a chance to serve as a schoolmaster within the city. In a 1482 letter to Jakob Barbaro, who was a prominent citizen of Antwerp and served at the time as the city's choir master, Agricola regrets to inform his friend that he cannot accept the teaching position presented to him by the city senate. He writes, quote, what is on offer is a school, something that is harsh, difficult, exacting. Its very appearance and entrance are depressing and austere. The flogging, crying, and wailing continuously remind one of a prison. It is more than anything else possibly the best example of a misnomer. In Greek, scola means leisure. In Latin, the technical term is ludas, or ludum literarium, a playground for reading and writing. Yet there is nothing less leisurely and more forbidding and nothing more at odds with anything playful. He goes on to say that Aristophanes, the Greek comedian, was more than correct when he termed it a phronisterium or a place of worries, end quote. Aside from this rather unflattering characterization of schools, Agricola's reason for turning down the role, reasons for turning down the role are many, including inadequate pay, the long hours and exhausting nature of the work, something I'm certain nobody in this room can relate to, and the distinct lack of prestige that accompanied teaching at a grammar school. Now, the portion of Agricola's letter that I have outlined just now reveals his ideas surrounding what school should be versus his decidedly negative perception of what schools in the early modern period had become. He argues to Barbaro that education ideally would be a playful and enjoyable experience for all parties involved, places where children's minds and social skills could be sufficiently cultivated. Later in the same letter, Agricola even goes so far as to offer advice to Barbaro and by extension, the city senate regarding how to properly select a teacher to fulfill this role. Any grammar teacher, he cautions, must be knowledgeable in the trivium, that is grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and that the city must be weary of unqualified charlatans seeking the position. Furthermore, Agricola implores, quote, now your city, Antwerp, is trying to find a teacher for its boys of a young and tender age. The foundations are being laid, as it were, for the whole of their remaining lives. And at this vulnerable age, their minds are to be instructed. So let them look wherever they can, and if they find him, spare no expense, for they are not making a decision about something of little significance, but about their own sons, whose interests and future lives they ought to be guarding vigilantly. And he finishes his argument by claiming that there is nothing more important than a decision like finding a qualified teacher, which is something that you might come to regret 
if done improperly, and then subsequently rectify only with great difficulty. So in his letter, Agricola clearly outlines the stakes <clears throat> for finding a good teacher to ed educate the city's youth. It's important to note that he is talking specifically about the education of boys, um, almost certainly at a Latin school, given his own educational credentials. However, as I hope to argue as uh, my chapter develops, I think this ideological argument um, ends up having much broader implications for a wide range of schools throughout the city. Um, the importance of an access to childhood education was seemingly not lost on Antwerp's civic leaders, considering the numerous reforms issued throughout the late 15th and early 16th centuries. That schooling served as a foundational institution for childhood and education um, crucial to the development of a good civic culture um, resonates with Antwerp's continued interest in and support for these enterprises, which served a socioeconomically diverse group of children. Returning to Fellert's schoolroom, the viewer is presented with an interior view of a vernacular primary school. Several aspects of the composition are worth further consideration. First, we know this is a vernacular school because of the presence of young girls being taught on the ground floor. Girls between the ages of four and 12 were permitted to attend primary school alongside their male peers. And education in this school begins at a very young age. Take, for example, the small boy in the center foreground um, who is practicing writing uh, with a stylus and wax tablet. Another telling feature of, for, of Fellert's image are the presence of adults who appear to be providing lessons in addition to the schoolmaster who oversees the school as a whole. There are two men, for example, sitting with pupils in the rafters on the upper right side of the composition and the woman gesturing towards the young boy who is writing, amongst others. This suggests that schooling was popular enough that it exceeded the abilities of a single schoolmaster and that the education within a school was delegated to other instructors. Indeed, the business of education was steadily growing throughout the city, resulting in a need for teachers who could adequately instruct the growing student bodies. Institutionalized schooling, which is to say formal education that was undertaken in spaces outside of the family home and the professionalization of teaching was an increasingly popular practice in the city. An extant um, advertisement from Basel, Switzerland, speaks to key aspects of this trend. Ambrosius Holbein's painted signboard for a schoolmaster from 1516 likely would have hung over the entrance to the home of a schoolmaster active in the city. The panel is painted on both sides and shows an austere interior space being used for the instruction of both children on one side, the larger image on the left, and adults on the opposite. On the first side, um, a schoolmaster and schoolmistress, presumably in this case husband and wife, are teaching four children of various ages. The schoolmaster stands with a child behind his lectern on the left side of the composition, holding a small bundle of sticks used for punishment, um, while two boys practice reading on benches in the middle of the space. On the right, the schoolmistress holds a very young child in her lap while gesturing towards a piece of paper on the lectern in front of her. The large German inscription above the scene is the same on both sides, and it tells the couple's potential students that they teach both reading and writing and are happy to instruct a wide variety of people, from burghers to craftsmen, both boys and girls. I'm still working through the translation, but that is the general gist of what they are offering and to whom. While this example is not from Antwerp and predates the establishment of the Schoolmasters Guild, 
archival records from the city indicate that teachers were required to post similar advertisements of their services outside their schools and or homes. When the Guild of St. Ambrose was founded in 1530, they counted approximately 80 members among their ranks. And by the middle of the 16th century, the Guild boasted upwards of 150 registered teachers, a number that held steady approximately for the remainder of the century due in part to a cap being placed on the number of teachers who were allowed to operate within the city. Antwerp had several types of schools serving children and adolescents. A child's education would begin at a vernacular school where they learned Dutch and sometimes French. Um, and they would first be taught to read and then after reading was sufficiently mastered, which usually took about three years, um, students were taught to write in the language with the possible addition of basic arithmetic. After this level of education was complete, boys could, if so desire, move forward into various types of secondary schools. In Antwerp, these included Latin schools affiliated with the city's five parish churches, where boys were trained for clergy and prepared and or prepared for entry into uh, a university or the so-called vernacular great schools and French schools respectively, which were aimed at middle-class boys seeking to continue their educations in grammar and also take up new subjects such as music, foreign languages, bookkeeping, more advanced mathematics, uh, and even in some cases, navigation. The range of types of primary and secondary schooling available in Antwerp and the relatively broad demographic of students to whom they catered, although it was certainly still financially prohibitive for some, indicates that the city <clears throat> and its citizens placed value on the social and economic accessibility of education. Vernacular schools were run by everyday citizens um, who had presumably the requisite knowledge in subjects, including reading and writing and math. Specifically, training to become a teacher does not appear to have been a requirement um, and instructors' capabilities to this end were not officially tested until much later in the century when an examination was required prior to being licensed by the guild. The apparent ease with which a person could open a school surely led to anxieties over the quality of education on offer. Two satirical images of schools from the late 1550s, Peter Bruegel the Elder's The Asset School and Peter van der uh, The Cobbler and His Wife as School Teacher, present the viewer with a markedly different and more negative view of schooling than Fellert's earlier print. These schoolrooms are calamitous. The teachers uh, clearly have more students than they can reasonably handle on their own. And the children um, in both images are effectively being left to their own devices. Um, and while critiques of schools through the 16th century were surely warranted, in certain occasions, the promise of what education could bring, and by extension, the city it's uh, bring to the city itself, remains, it seems, largely consistent with Agricola's ideas from almost a century prior. The last image that I would like to discuss briefly um, is uh, Peter Bruegel the Elder's print of Temperance from his series of the Seven Virtues. He here depicts the female personification of temperance standing atop a broken windmill blade, wearing a bridle in her mouth and a clock atop her head. On all sides, she's surrounded by vignettes representing the seven, <clears throat> the seven liberal arts, subjects key to an early modern humanist education, which Bruegel in this composition visually relates to practices and activities related directly to early modern Antwerp. For example, 
We have grammar in the lower right corner, which is a schoolmaster uh, with a number of school children in front of him who are practicing reading and writing. In the lower left <clears throat> is arithmetic, where we see men um, undertaking business at an accounting table. And in the upper left corner, rhetoric is represented at a rhetoricer's stage, which was you know, an activity well known to the city of Antwerp. But here, Bruegel foregrounds the subjects of grammar and arithmetic. Um, and in so doing, like places them as the foundation, foundational skills that lead to all of the activities unfolding in the background. In Antwerp, <clears throat> there was a changing interest in the role of children in the social and civic orders. And these shifting attitudes led to the expansion of institutional structures for children like schools that aided in the education and social development of future citizens. As part of the changing educational landscape, there grew a focus towards pragmatic skills um, to train the next generation of merchants, bankers, and civic leaders with the idea that beginning at a young age, you could cultivate a good group of um, citizens that would then propel the city forward um, successfully well into the future. Thanks. That's Thank you very much, uh, Felicity, for this uh, interesting talk. I have many, many questions. So uh, Cynthia, can you put on your camera? So we can, uh, I want to stop the PowerPoint. Yes, there we are, both of you here. Uh, already a suggest a help of, uh, of uh, Marie-Louise Runch for you, uh, Cynthia. She is very happy to help you with the translations from German. So that's uh, already some help uh, you have. Please put all your questions in the chat, but I would first like to, to ask my own questions. That's the privilege of <laughs> organizing. Uh, Cindy, a question for you. Uh, you, you showed us a, a broad range of possible associations, huh? uh, from the rainbow to other shells. But, but what I was thinking is what about the soap bubble? Huh? A soap bubble, which in Dutch still lives is, is very prominent and uh, is thought to, to, to evoke the volatility of life. So thinking about that, the soap bubble, uh, if that could be compared to, to, to the modern pearl, uh, do we also have kind of a, a connotation, some, some evaluation given to it? Huh? For example, the idea that we still have with all the glitter, that the bad connotation of, of, of maybe that, um, that iridescence. That's a really interesting point. I think I hadn't really thought along those lines because everything I've been reading has been comparing um, iridescence to to the rainbow. And so less talking less about glitter and more specifically about the range of color that you're able to see in iridescent material. Um, and so even though they talk about these, these natural philosophers talk about, they mention the soap bubble as a material that has that surface iridescence. They don't really discuss any of the moralistic uh, connotations associated with it. And similarly in, um, in treaties for teaching artists how to paint, um, like Van Mander and Hoogstraten, um, when they discuss, they're talking about the mechanics of painting. So how do how to depict it realistically and less about any of the connotations associated with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And then uh, a question for, for uh, Felicity. It's, I think, a bit of a very obvious question. <laughs> but if you compare the Antwerp situation with uh, the Mexico City situation, how to do that? What, what will that bring, bring about? Can you already give us some, some clues of the, the rest of your uh, project? Yeah, so I think the connections between Antwerp and Mexico City lie um, in large respect to the very uh, robust book trade that was ongoing between these two early modern cities and the subsequent influx of 
humanist ideas and teaching practice practices into colonial Mexico City with the arrival of the Spanish. And so my project is looking at, at hopefully, how um, indigenous educational systems um, from the pre-Hispanic period were like kind of intertwined with what the Spanish then implemented upon their arrival and how education was adapted to meet the needs of this colonial society, which would have been invested in the same types of kind of long-term looking, but in a decidedly different way. Because in the case of the colonial Spanish powers, their primary interest would have been education in order to cultivate good colonial citizens um, from like indigenous children and young people living in Mexico mm -hmm. City. So that's where I'm hoping to go with the educational aspect of it. And then these broader questions that I have about where children exist in the like larger social and civic orders of both of these places. Um, I think education feeds into that, but hopefully my project will also expand more to consider um, like social customs outside of schools as well and their existence in the material and visual record. Sounds great. Sounds like uh, you have a wonderful project in front of you. <laughs> So. A question of Hanneke, Hanneke Groteboer uh, at the Radboud University. Uh, a question for, for Cindy. The still lives you showed are clearly studies of materiality, or rather of the perception of materiality. What painting cannot do, obviously, is capture the kinetic qualities of Mother of Pearl surfaces. And Nautilus needs to be moved so as to experience its iridescence. How will you address this effective quality in your research? Was it addressed in the 17th century by other people than natural philosophers? So something I didn't really have time to get into is how um, painting treaties talk about uh, painting pearls and other similar materials. And um, in my larger project, I'm interested in thinking about that side of the depiction of iridescent surfaces in terms and relating it to um, instructions on how to paint people in skin and the requirement of having to layer paints to be able to build up a sense of depth and liveliness in the material. So even though um, artists know that they're unable to fully capture this, the, the movement and the effective qu affectative quality of experiencing the um, the shell in person, I think they're still thinking about how to attempt um, attempt to get at the sense through thinking about the surface as something that is, is complex. And um, this relates maybe to an idea that as um, natural philosophers were figuring out how light worked, um, I think Hook perhaps makes a suggestion that there is a, vi a vibrative uh, motion in the material that um, that makes it iridescent and um, this sort of relating movement and life together is a um, thread that I want to keep pursuing. Mm -hmm. And there is no clue whatsoever that the artists used also microscopes or telescopes in order um, to get a better view on that iridescence? As far as I know, they don't use it specifically to study iridescence. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's very well bad documented, of course, you know, for the yeah. artists use that kind of document. Huh? Right. Uh, a question for for Felicity is, uh, oh, and before before uh, I give that question to Felicity, Hanneke Grotbrug was also the, the author, uh, the co-author of Concofilia, so that uh, more or less uh, is, is a similar kind of subject of research, but of course from a different angle. Uh, Felicity, uh, uh, another question for you is, is about Vellard's uh, print. Uh, in how far can we reconstruct uh, an architectural reality? Yeah? Do we have some knowledge more than just out of the prints of the rooms, the buildings that were used uh, as schools? Yeah, so this is a little bit more complicated because 
What we do know about uh, how schools operated were that many vernacular schools were just held in people's homes. So school teachers would, you know, open their living rooms to young students during the day. And there were not necessarily a large number of like designated school buildings that we would think of as being places that children are sent to go learn. Some certainly did exist. There is um, uh, an existing early modern school building in Leiden. Um, and like the papal schools would have had more infrastructure for things like that. But in terms of vernacular schooling, um, <clears throat> it's a little bit hard to reconstruct. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping, I don't know how far I will get with this, but when the guild was formed and teachers started to have, they started having to formally register where they were undertaking um, education and where their schools were located, um, if any of those buildings you know, still exist, uh, it might be possible to get a better mm -hmm. idea of where they were in the city or the types of spaces that were being used. But I think to some extent, Fellert's print is a little bit strange in the way he has visually constructed the school because it doesn't necessarily appear as though somebody is using their home, like with the rafters and um, the large space of the school and the fact that it's two stories. Um, I'm thinking about like Holbein's signboard where you have this kind of small interior space or even the space that's represented in the cobbler and his wife as school teacher where you are given the sense that it is in their studio domestic space. There's a hearth, um, there are tools associated with schoolmaking, but Fellert's print is doing something different than that. Um, and I, so I don't know if there's a good answer to constructing an architectural reality, um, mm -hmm. but I think that there is something there if I can find the sources to back it up. Yes. <clears throat> then there's a question of your advisor. Uh, Mark oh, good. Uh, in your discussion of the Bruegel Temperancia, mm -hmm. I was convinced with the suggestion of arithmetic and grammar being presented as foundational by placing in the foreground. Would it be possible to expand on this, thinking of a chiastic structure, corner to corner, in terms of moving from those foundations towards what we would call applied knowledge at work in the world with Temperancia, temperance as the pivot do Agricola, Vives, or Erasmus say anything about using education in the world? I think that there is an argument to be made there with the way Bruegel has visually structured that print. I have not at this time gotten very far into the literature on temperance um, uh, in the early modern period, which is one of the threads that I am going to start investigating because as I was putting together this presentation, I kind of realized that I should look more closely into um, conceptions of temperance as it relates to kind of building um, a city and these kinds of like educational activities within. Um, so uh, that's like a future line of research that I am pursuing. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. And there's uh, the suggestion of Marika uh, to look at uh, education and schooling as discussed by social historians. But mm -hmm. since she is in the same uh, place at the moment, uh, uh, having her office very close to you, it's, uh, it's good to just drop by and ask uh, which social historians uh, could be uh, of, of help for, uh, for exploration. All right. It's uh, seven o'clock in uh, the Netherlands. So we just had this hour. Thank you very, very much, Felicity and, and Cindy, for uh, two very nice, interesting uh, talks. And of course, thanks to the audience for being here and for their questions. I hope to see you very, very soon. Uh, next week, we have a talk of uh, Geertjan Janssen, the new director of the Rembrandt Vereniging. All right, see you all there. Bye-bye.